The all-new Volvo V90, the estate version, or the Kombi as we say in German, that is today on Auto Gefühl, your number one resource for in-depth car reviews and your number one community to discuss cars with Thomas. So we focused on the sedan version, the Volvo S90 before. That review you will find in the video description. Today it's about the V90. We'll show you also different versions and trims and explain you everything you need to know about this car. An exterior, interior and the driving experience. And we will also tell you something of the comparison to the competitors. Let's go with this here in Autogefühl in full HD, full screen and full length. Let's go. start with the front here for the V90. It's the same as in the S90. This is the inscription trim level, the top luxury trim level and here the front grille has those vertical fins. Overall a beautiful seamless Scandinavian design, especially also with those Thor's Hammer LED lights which have this T LED signature, a key element of the new Volvos. Also the V40 facelift recently received that one and also stronger lower bump here in the inscription trim level and you will soon see the R design difference there the front grille has this dot design which one do you prefer but overall I think the front of the new V or S90 one of my favorites also yours 4 meters 96 or 16 foot 3 is the total length of this vehicle it's the same as in the S90. Here of course the V90, the biggest difference is that we got the continuous roof line for the estate version. If you wonder by, by the way why we're in a parking lot here today, well it's raining quite heavily outside meanwhile and here is a safe and dry spot. And I always think that those parking lots here always deliver a very special atmosphere. I hope you enjoy that with us here as well. Let's take a look at the rims because they are here in 20 inch in the inscription trim level. Overall you start from 17 to maximum of 22. In the S9 review we gave you a lot of rim choices. If you're interested in that before your order maybe also check out those. And you can also go with smaller ones maybe 19 for example then it will still look really great. And the color this bright blue is called muscle blue. Not like this muscle, but more the muscle at the at the sea, you know, at the at the shore. Door handles really huge and have those chrome accentuations as well as the chrome right here. And I always love it when you see the raindrops right here over the car. That looks really so beautiful. And inscription chrome at the lower part of the car as well. And then this roof rail. And some might say, hmm, yeah. The Swedes, they used to build great estates. Will it be also be the case today? We will soon take a look inside, but you can already see it right here. We don't lose too much space on the inside, so there are a lot of estates nowadays that fall down quite early and then you lose a lot of space on the inside. It's not the case here. Design line above the door handles and then the strong shoulders that form those vertical taillights we already know from the XC90 and they also sit on the same platform. And here we can see the taillights up close. They really rem remind us of the XC90 and are fundamentally different to the S90. And some of you said, mm, not really satisfied with the S90 taillights. I also think this one here is more beautiful, although I'm more of a shape fan guy of a sedan. But here I think the rear is more beautiful with the estate. What's your opinion? Put me that one in the comments. You pay about 3000 euros extra for the estate version. Mm, that's not cheap. But if you, for example, compare a Mercedes E Class estate, that is even more expensive than in the T model version, as we say in Germany. 
So overall is quite okay from the extra price here and it's about 45,000 euros it starts in Germany and will be about $50,000 in the US overall. And what else? This one here, V90 T5, this is a big petrol engine and Yes, the inscription batch that says this is the inscription version also features some chrome elements at the lower part and those fake exhaust, the real one is hidden down there. And as a comparison, this is the R design. You can see here this front grille with a kind dot structure in dark black. Which one do you like more? And also the lower part is a little bit more aggressive again with this black style. Of course, I really love the stronger blue color here from the R design. And the side profile does not feature a chrome lip in the lower part, but side mirror contrast in bright silver or matte silver, very beautiful, and 21 inch rims. Those ones are even optional for the R design. And wow, really huge. You have to be careful not to damage them. And the rear differences are minor. You see here a little bit more chrome contrast. And I can hear a more sporty dark style. This is the special inscription car key. They could do it with fall leather, that would be sufficient, but they didn't. So, and then slim to fit in the pocket. Solid door handles, really huge. See, like this, they open a little bit to the front as well. Very funny process. And solid closing sound overall. Car makes a very good build impression quality. My favorite is this open cell wood here. I would always go for that. And yes, I don't have any problems with cutting off trees. Then, everything in the bright surface here and usually the outside parts are from faux leather and the seat parts from the genuine animal skin. Here, chrome again is used, solid metal, everything. Really love the build quality. Then, first look at the interior. What is interesting, from a style, I mean this fitting bright surfaces to the muscle blue on the exterior, that is a very real setup. However, they are lacking of animal skin alternatives here in the higher trim levels. You have to go for the momentum trim level to get cloth seats, for example, or our design then for at least microfiber on the inside. Instruments all digital, soon more details to that. The steering wheel does not very much fit to the rest of the car but what does fit very well are those entry caps at the lower part and as it's not very bright here you can also see how they are illuminated at night and storage space at the inside of the doors you can see it right here how we can also put bottles in here not too big and let's get inside for the inscription trim level, you have to calculate about 20,000 bucks extra. Mm. That's a lot of money. So my price performance would be to go for middle trim level and momentum trim level because usually you already got everything you need inside there then and you can just pick some options extra. What I love most about the Volvo cars are actually two things. First of all, the serial safety equipment. Autonomous emergency brake is, for example, always uh, included in every Volvo and also a lot of the other assistance systems. And therefore, also the Volvo cars are one of the safest on the roads. The second thing is the comfort of the seats. And the seat form itself really fits my body very well. They're high enough, 
broad enough and they offer you a great long-term comfort. You can also set it here electronically, everything up and down. The rear part of the seats this is here for the front part to lengthen the seating area for taller people like me. <laughs> it's really fun. Oh wow, that goes really long in there. And here you can also then change later on when we put the car on. I can show you that as well. We've got a storage space in the front of this and here it slides down smoothly. Wasn't it a little bit more weird in the S90 before? Maybe they fixed it. Here, look at that. Wow. Smoothly. Great build quality. The steering wheel can be adjusted like this manually to all four ways. Just the design of the steering wheel, I think um, I've told you that when reviewing the XC90. Um, I think the design of the steering wheel does not fit the rest of the car. I would have wished something else. There are also the parts here on the steering wheel. They are not that premium as the rest of the car. Um, you know, maybe they think about a new steering wheel in a facelift. And also the R design steering wheel looks a little bit better. But overall, a great comfort. Of course, you sit lower than in the XC90 as it's a sedan or an estate, but still a good position here for long-term run and probably among the best in this upper mid-size segment. Cockpit overview and really a beautiful job and one of my favorites also in this segment of this clean Scandinavian design. Horizontal lines right there and also the structure. We can take a detailed look at that one soon. Um, it is uh, artificial plastic, but it has a very interesting structure that feels high class and also looks high class premium. Those vents on the vertical side, maybe that's the only thing that's not fitting 100%. Other than that, we got this open cell soft wood used here. And again, the remark here, you can use wood from sustainable sources. You cannot slaughter animals in a sustainable way. That's the difference between using animal skin seats and wood in a the car. Then Bowers & Wilkins sound system. We will soon test that one. I can already promise you this is really great stuff. Less buttons here. Everything is moved into the infotainment screen. We will soon tell you more about that. Warning indicators and just the mandatory buttons are used here and you can still control the sound. But that's it, by the way. So nice from the sound. Then the automatic shifting lever. And here in the lower part, you have those retractable covers, also with wood, good build quality, 12 volt power supply, and beverage holders inside here. So everything you might need. And again, here um, in the very first models of the XC90, we also found some of the parts which were on like 100% fit. Meanwhile, the build quality is really at the premium level. Look here how the middle armrest was designed to fit the other part. And you can put up, and you see it's also heavily fixed. And CD or DVD slot, USB port. We will also plug in the phone right there that we can show the infotainment system and some more space in the middle part. And here you can stop and start the engine or the ignition with this diamond structure and also for the driving modes. We will tell you more about the different driving modes when we drive the car. Then this infotainment screen, you get it optional in the higher trim levels. I think every Volvo V9 that leaves the plant will have this screen then because hardly anyone buys the very, very, very basic Volvo. You control everything via touch. You have those different main screens, for example here with the uh, basic apps. Then there's this screen here where you can also set it individually. Um, to the left, there's another one, for example, for the assistance systems where you can deactivate, park pilot, um, and so on. This is the first basic setup you can go, and then the, um, the button here in the lower part always returns you to the main menu. And the buff pad here is for the settings. For example, I can also go to a system here and change the language, and that's also a good sign. I didn't learn that before. Um, it's a good sign for how easy a system is to control and that is 
relatively intuitive, so you can find those things fairly easy. Um, especially the one thing above here, um, you have to learn that, that this one exists and sometimes you're searching some systems, for example the camera, when you're going in the basement garage, you're searching for a button, well which one can I press it, I don't hit my car in the front, remember to go like this and then here hit camera. Um, I can also show it when I turn on the ignition, then camera will be available, you see everything pops up then here, then camera and the resolution is really great and if I close the door we can also um, show you the other camera, uh, I think it's the it's the third door that is missing and look at the screen while I'm closing the door, the rear door behind us. That's the traffic info, always very annoying. And also the rear hatch. Let's see if I can so also close it from here, from the interior with the button. Then this camera appears and this camera appears. <laughs> there we have it. The fake drone view from above. And there are also different views available. I can also switch the cameras, for example, to the rear view camera. There's our tripod and open suitcase. And the resolution is really crisp. And what is also great, here this vertical screen in this case helps us very much because when you're going in the front you can see more. Look at the great resolution so the camera system is one of the best we know on the market definitely. Then more to the infotainment system. Um, you can also adjust the head-up display for example right here. Yeah, There it is for example on and out. I can see it in the front now. Then what else is important here? phone you can either add phone here and connect it via Bluetooth that's the one possibility the other possibility you see here Apple CarPlay Android Auto um, I just plug it in here we go there's smoothie so start from applications pane and I have to unlock the phone then. So, see what you guys should work now. Oh. Okay. Maybe deactivate the flight mode. Sometimes it needs that to start. Well, I just did it and then it worked completely. Didn't have any problems yet. And what does it mean, start from application Spain? We had to search for it a little bit, because most other cars, they directly start the Apple CarPlay, no matter what you do. Here you have to scroll right, and then there it is. And there will also Android Auto appeal, appear, and then um, you're fine with that one. So you've started that, you've chosen it, blah, blah, blah. Okay. And then you have to disconnect and reconnect it again, the system says. Let's see. Yes. A little bit complicated, and then I have to um, uh, access it right here. So, oh, and then we have the sound system. Nice. So that's the Bowers & Wilkins sound system, and I can also show you that. Um, we go to here to sound experience. We can change a lot of stuff here you can almost feel like a like a DJ here and my favorite stuff is because we can change it to studio for example sound optimized for rear seats or for all driver you can really change that then the sound characteristics and my favorite is here concert hall wow that is really great stuff because this is here um, for the Gossenborg Symphony Orchestra they have imitate how the sound is inside here and there you have a great surround sound. It will sound very weird when you're listening to a radio, to a voice in the radio, but music is so great with that one. One of my favorite sound systems. So, and maybe we can also um, show you again the Apple CarPlay system right here. There it is how uh, you can also access the phone, um, your music and the messages and also the use your own GPS over the phone. And what about the GPS in the Volvo itself? There we have it. You can uh, go with it like an, um, like an iPhone but not directly like this. There it is. For example here for zoom in out here like this. 
you to change the, the tabs, but zooming in and out directly works. Um, you can also maximize it. And then it's also possible to use it to scroll. You see the reaction time is very fast. And here again the vertical setup helps. A horizontal one maybe looks more fancy somehow, but for a GPS and for the camera system a vertical setup is better. So overall a very spectacular system here for the infotainment again. How do you like it? Instruments, they are all digital and have this ignition show for us. Right side RPM, left side speed and in the middle one you can also uh, have some information for example on the uh, on the GPS or also on your on your sound and so on on the if you have picked something for the radio I can scroll through some of the things here you can also have your um, consumption for example right there there are radio information if you have a GPS um, goal mounted you can also let that show in there here on the left side you can also change the ACC, Adaptive Cruise Control, the different distance. We also test the ACC when we drive the car, of course. And there's also the voice command. Hello! Searching music and radio. Music <laughs> search. What would you like to listen to? And this is how it looks like when you have a GPS mounted in there. And more storage spaces, for example, the glove box slides down smoothly and enough space and it can also be cooled. That's how you close it and that's how you open it. The same as in the Audi Q5 recently, that the system for the cooled glove box is a little bit weird in the build quality. Then again another look here at the storage space on the inside, how you can slide that open for small space there. 12 hour power supply, bottles fit like this adaptive those beverage holders and my favorite closing cover right there and we have the optional panoramic roof mounted here wow with the purple light then you can slide that shade open um, I mean for example when it's really hot of course if you're living in a very hot climate maybe leave that out completely and then you can open it and that is quite wide and it lets in a lot of light Let's see we can that's the maximum position we got here now and this will lose some headroom in the rear but we can test it and now to the rear compartment let's get inside the doors open not that wide but I mean still it's okay to get in here also the beautiful Scandinavian design continue in the rear with the wood and the bright colors and a lot of space in front of my knees and wow maybe the last time I tested it I sat maybe too far to the rear now I've tested again I'm 1 meters 86 or 6 foot 1 really a lot of space um, only I would maybe tell the driver to lift the seat a little lift the seat a little bit up that I can put my feet a little bit toward, uh, beneath the seat it would be Good. Then there's a net here. There will also be um, 12 volt power supply illuminated, and also there's a climate control here for the rear seats. If I turn on the ignition, then we maybe also get a picture of that. No, and it's sometimes always a difference if you have to turn on the ignition or if you have to turn on the engine. In this case, I need to turn on the engine, and then you will see that there are also the climate controls get illuminated right there now they are illuminated here and then you can also control them let's see there it is so this is here for the temperature right and left and this would be here for clicking or sliding for the vent control very interesting luxury feature and of course you have to pay for everything optional then what about the headroom, because this is here important in the V version and this is the big advantage in comparison to the sedan. And here you can see the estate version here, the Combi, has the same headroom with the panoramic roof or even a little bit more than the S90 without the panoramic roof. So here you can even have tall persons in the rear and still all of the panoramic roof if you want the maximum headroom then 
go for the estate here and leave the panoramic roof out. But still, even for tall people, you see it works. And the tall people, they have really a very good view to the outside that will be great for traveling. Overall, a very good seating position here also in the rear. So comfortable, again, with the Volvo unique feature that they offer those very comfortable seats. Some more space in inside here and beverage holders, they flip out like this. And you can also flip the seats, Isofix covers by the way for child seats. And flipping the seats, for example, goes right here. There it is. And you already see that this gives you a little uh, even loading surface with a soft cover. Wow, great soft cover. And we have this two third, one third split basically. But we can also use this ski hatch right there. So uh, I think we have to open it from behind. But here, this is the hole then for the ski hatch. And let's see if we can also flip those seats from the rear. And now, and again, a special test. You might remember one of our XC90 reviews. There's a special feature where you can fold down the rear head restraints from the front when the car is turned on, that you have a better view to the rear when there's no passenger on the rear seat. And there are different sensors of how the car realizes that the car is sitting here, maybe with a seat belt or also maybe with a weight sensor that is usually used on the front seats only. So let's try again. When I sit here and then um, press the headrest fold in the front. If those head restraints will fold down, then we'll test it again with the seat belt on if the car reacts on that. So our cameraman Thomas today, yes, Thomas in front and behind the camera today, will now press the headrest fold button. I will hide myself that I don't get hit like last year. Yeah, you see? So it does not work with the sensor that someone is sitting here. That should be improved. And let's now try on with the seat belt. If the seat belt then tells the car, hey, someone is sitting here. No, it does not. Hmm. Think of all the engineers. Something to do for you. Uh, hey, <laughs> what the hell? <laughs> I almost got hit again. <laughs> That's again when you want to. Uh, <laughs> when you want to, uh, you know, punish your children sitting here when they're maybe too loud and silence, bam. Oh. But now seriously, with children, it might not damage me permanently, but with children, it's quite strong. So, but I don't try it with the children. Then to the hatch and the loading compartment, you can also press the button on the key. There it is. You have to press a little bit harder. Then you see the cover slides up automatically. That's a clean solution. You can also remove it manually completely. If you want to um, you know, completely remove it, for example, then you have to go right here and then you can get it out. And there you see behind it, there's another option that you can put a cover right like this. What is interesting here, first of all, I mean, it's not in, like in the very, very old Volvo estates where you had really a square form in the rear. You do lose space here, yes. But then again, no one would probably buy those cars from design anymore. For fixation belts, practical and good high quality solution. Then you can flip out this one here to split the trunk, maybe to put just the backpack like this. This would be a possibility and also use the net for very smaller parts, maybe when transporting something that shouldn't flip when you wear maybe guests at your grandma and want to transport some soup at home, at home. So, and then this whole part can be put up as well. And I think mm, there should be also be some replacement tire available, I guess. Um, yeah, there it is. And then interesting here to flip the seats electronically and the left part very versatile solution we also got a 12 volt power supply in here and then you can see you have a really great loading space all through and so yes they can still build very versatile estates a lot of space inside here and again a big advantage if you compare it with the s90 and child safety 
Yeah, it could be a little bit more sensitive. Mercedes has it a little bit more sensitive, but this is more sensitive than all of the cars from the Volkswagen Corporation. So I would say the standard result is quite okay. And you can also just go for a manual version of the hatch, then you can grab it like this, for example. Sometimes I prefer a manual hatch because um, when you have something loaded in here, for example, like handlebars from a bicycle, then you can press it gently and see, ah, does it fit, does it not fit? With the electric one, bam, it closes and might damage something. So I'm more a fan of the manual work here in this case. And now also look in the interior from the R design variant. And as I've told you earlier, this one would be a good solution, for example, if you go for higher trim level and um, at least in the middle part, you have the microfiber option there, very beautiful from the design and also better for the climate comfort because this year it's very cold today, so it doesn't get cold. You feel it, it's cold here, but it's warm here. So it's not cold in winter and you don't sweat on it that much in summer times. Also, the R design features more carbon fiber elements. There's a real carbon fiber as a design highlight. There's a special steering wheel, this R design steering wheel with a badge at the lower part and perforated sides. And also more carbon fiber, for example, at the inside of the doors. So, what's your favorite inscription or the R design from exterior or interior? And also, the rear seats have the same design here so my my tip for you would be either go for a momentum trim level for price performance and cloth seats or if you want the highest trim level then rather go for the R design to have those seats in here you will be very satisfied with them again I love those raindrops on the hood don't they look beautiful and beneath the hood engine this is here the T5 big petrol engine but they only use two liter four cylinders here 254 horsepower and there's also the t6 with 320 horsepower and on the diesel side there would be a d4 with 190 horsepower and the d5 with 235 horsepower and the big engines they always get connected with all-wheel drive <coughs> and the automatic gearbox All right, let's start our driving part. Can clear up the rain. And what is very interesting here, I can also show you that while driving and with the camera system. So here the camera system. I can now also see the front if maybe the view would be blocked or if I'm going over, over a bump. And you can also very well always see the fake drone view from above then if you want it if you're for example getting getting slower I can show you that here when I'm just fake I would be going in this narrow spot here I can either see the rear view camera or switch to the 360 view and then I can very well see if I do fit in here or not so overall again a very convincing camera system Looks just great to, to watch it, even uh, you know if you're driving the car uh, live yourself. That's uh, that's really the funny thing. So, and we're driving this two-liter four-cylinder engine, with 250 horsepower, petrol engine, and it will basically deliver you enough power. I can already tell you so far. In this price regions, if you think about you know 45,000 entry. 20,000 more with the inscription trim or with the R design and then the final price of this vehicle here is about 75,000 all of the extras yeah that's expensive but other upper mid-size premium cars are in the same price region and then again you have to think about does that fit to a two-cylinder uh, four-cylinder two-liter two, two four-cylinder engine that's it and I personally don't have any problem with it because you know we are 
on a transition to hybrid and electric cars anyway. So, I mean, if it's not the sport car, it's also not too bad that you don't have this roaring sound. So I'm fine with it. Are you as well? Looking forward to your feedback. Here in this driving part, we will tell you something about city driving. Also countryside, autobahn, we'll have the different aspects of this car covered for you. Overall, you have this typical, very cozy Volvo feeling. So you immediately feel at home. And sometimes in one of those very high luxury Mercedes car, for example, um, you sometimes get a little bit overwhelmed. Um, so you have to get used to the car more. Here with the Volvo, you don't have the, um, the feeling that you would need ages to, to get used to the car, for example. Also, you also have a good overview on the GPS always. That really helps. And so we'll be going left here right soon. The sound insulation overall is very good. Um, also, when you lower the windows, we have this double sound insulation layer here that you can, you know, put your finger inside of the windows. That's very interesting. And again, those superb comfortable seats they help you really to relax on a long journey so this is really one of the most comfortable cars in this segment we have suspension wise here the air suspension mounted if you go for that one it's only in the rear do you well, do you immediately feel that Hmm, yeah, it's really hard to feel directly. I mean, if we're going over some bumps in the city right now, it's really hard to tell. Okay, in the front there's none, but you do have air suspension in the rear. There will be a difference in comfort. For example, also Mercedes offers that in the E-Class. You can either go, it's recently covered with the, with the T model, you could indeed either go with the air suspension just in the rear, but also could go for the air suspension for both. That is, oh, there will be a train passing the street very soon, so we'll turn around and go the other way. That's also a good test now for the turning circle. And that is one of the bad things about this car. The turning circle is above 11 meters. And that's really not that good. Um, so it feels, feels not that agile while turning on standstill. You have a problem with that. However, in normal corners, we will also test that very soon. It does feel agile enough. And that will also be a question when we now test the different driving modes. What about the balance of comfort and agility? That's definitely a crucial point. It is basically a long car, five meters. Well, now we are not allowed to turn right. Weird German traffic. <laughs> so, steering wheel. It's not the most sporty or no, most direct one, but overall it, it feels, let's say it feels natural. We'll turn right here again then and go just just go in a circle. You can also see when I go in a 90 degree turn how I have to turn the steering wheel and we have experienced cars where we had to um, let's say turn it less. Here now let's go over some Kopfstein, so-called Kopfsteinpflaster. That's always very interesting. And you hear I don't have to raise my voice that much. That's still okay. And here another proof for turning the, the steering wheel. Going to the rear. Now again, the camera system helps pretty much. Wow, what a clear resolution. Well, what does help you is that the steering, as you may feel, the steering is very light. So you don't need too much power to, stern, to turn the steering wheel. And that might be important for some of the drivers. The brakes also react very well. Sound from the turning indicators, also pretty okay. Some are very annoying, this one isn't. Also, uh, the other warning sounds, um, 
for example, if you maybe release here your um, seat belt. First of all, I just get a visual warning. So it's not like it immediately starts with bow, 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 like we experienced in some other cars. So they thought about those small details and overall I'm really satisfied with that. Now we'll go straight. <laughs> Always a nice view on the Baust Wilk and sound system, by the way, if you look at different speakers right there. So overall, it's when you're considering some city and traffic here, um, you have a big car, but you don't feel that you would be, you know, too huge blocking the road. Of course, the car is very easy to steer and it gives you this cozy feeling. So even if there are a lot of tricky traffic situations, you always remain calm, good sound insulation, the great calming Scandinavian design and maybe you um, turn up your favorite music with the orchestra music scheme and then you'll be perfectly fine by that. When we go out of the city very soon and also to the Autobahn, we will also test the different driving modes because basically we have comfort that's where we're in at the moment. We have eco and we have dynamic and individual. Individual you can just, for example, just you change the throttle input, just like one or two elements, which one you, you want to pick. Eco, I can show you that very soon, that also changes the instruments in the front to this green half circle. And the eco drive then use the coasting or sailing function that means that we don't use engine brake the speed is not reduced that much the car is more rolling and that saves fuel and it does not make sense when you're going downhill all the time because you then want to use the engine brake but I mean for example also in the city when you're really looking forward when is the red traffic light here when when it's green let's just try it here with the eco drive and I can show you that so first of all, the throttle input is reduced a little bit and um, now meanwhile I can just like let the car roll, leave the foot of the throttle and you see we relatively remain the speed 38, 37, 36, 35 and if I go to the dynamic for example, it would be the opposite, 30, 29, 20, oops. So um, this dynamic mode in contrast to that Yes, I turned up later and turned down earlier. And that is, again, the, the different effects. So you have more engine brake than, um, especially when you maybe a gear higher here now. And I think we'll spare you some of the waiting period now and head on to the Autobahn where we can really hammer the throttle that you can also experience some of the performance of the engine. So it's out one time now and let's also test the performance here in the corners. The engine. It's a little bit wet today. So the uh, car's pushing a little bit to the outside. And let's now go 70 to whatever. Let's You don't have this roaring sound, but performance wise, I think you can't moan about it, and you also don't miss an all wheel drive in this case. Um, when you're accelerating out a corner from standstill, for example, and it's wet, then you do feel the front wheels are spinning, have not enough traction, then you could use an all wheel drive. For the other situations, you will mostly also be just fine with that one here. Let's also show you the difference when I'm going into the dynamic mode. So dynamic mode it is now. And now I'm accelerating from 100. Here it turns higher. 140. So the gear. 
gears are more used, higher RPM figures then, and overall you also get a better acceleration. Let's also try to experience if other characteristics change. I think the steering wheel got a little bit stiffer. That's how it feels. Let's see, if we get more feedback in the corner. The steering wheel has not that, not such a smooth transition. When it's, for example, here now it's rather stiff, and then if we go in this direction here, here it's a little bit soft, then it gets stiffer again. So I think they didn't, didn't find the most natural setup for that one. Now at higher speeds, sound insulation is still very good. Let's also test if the dynamic mode is a... So there was lane change in dynamic mode. And then go back to the comfort mode. Lane change at the same speed. Yeah, oh yeah. So first of all, the, in comfort mode, the car is wobbling around more. Also, the steering wheel is softer. Now again, dynamic mode. Yeah, it's, I think the steering wheel does make a big difference. And again, good performance also from the engine in the higher speed regions. That's no problem. So, I mean, in, in one of the first tests, I said um, the car is more focusing on comfort and cannot match the high speed performance from the German premium manufacturers. And then some of you said, ah, you didn't maybe try the dynamic mode. And yeah, but I think that the dynamic mode mostly changed something with the steering wheel. Still, the suspension is rather set on comfort. Let's see if I can find a difference when riding straight. So all between eco and dynamic. Going over some bumps here now. It's a smooth feeling. Good comfort. Now we're going to dynamic. Yeah, you do feel that. Maybe, maybe you also feel like pop, 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 pop. So you do have a stiffer suspension in a dynamic mode. The question is, do you want that? And from an upper mid-size car, I would rather expect this comfortable ride. And therefore, I also don't think that it's any bad that we don't have the sportiest characteristics here. I think it's rather good because that's what you should expect from such a car here. But if you want to change the suspension here, at least you can have the different driving modes if you went for that adaptive one. So it is possible to drive it sportier with the dynamic mode. Yes, that's true. So that's also one of the findings here today again. I promised you I'll test it again. Let's do another lane change. Yeah, I think it also has something to do with the steering wheel that mm, you feel like you would have to be a little bit more careful at higher speeds. And I think that's really due to the steering wheel because it doesn't feel that natural. So here it's again a little soft, then it gets stiff, but then the effect on the road is very huge. So you have to get used to it. So overall from the suspension, really keen on that one, very comfortable and also good that you can stiffen it up with the dynamic mode. If you uh, would like to, that gives you a little bit more security for example, when you're riding in higher speeds. But I think the steering setup, the same as I've mentioned in the Alfa Giulia, I think they didn't really match it to a high speed situations. This is something, however, primarily for German customers. And it, just if they go that fast, not everyone does. <laughs> so in, in some markets, it might not even be, be that important. So we're going off this main motorway here now. Here we get some cornering agility, at the moment in comfort mode. It is still fun to drive the car also fast. No, no question. But here you feel it's pushing a little bit over the front wheels. Get the next corner, try the dynamic mode again. Get more feedback from the car then. So the dynamic mode is primarily a lot of fun for example, on, on very dry roads. 
uh, and on very flattened out roads, that's for sure. But then to the assistance systems. First of all, the adaptive cruise control. I'll set it now to 80, for example. And the both systems are really working very flawlessly. You can also see everything in the head-up display. The head-up display gives a very clear view of the speed. And also they have the cruise control mounted. And also when I change the distance, I can not only see it in the front in the instruments, but also in the head-up display that I'm changing the, the preset distance for the car in front of me. There is also this pilot assist available. I've activated here right now, also at the steering wheel. And this pilot assist, when it shows the green steering, can also drive the car autonomously. So far, it's not thought that I would leave the hands of the steering wheel. I'm just doing it for display purposes now. Please don't, don't do this at home, kids. Now it says apply steering. I should take over again. Now the car canceled it. Because this system is so far really um, designed to help you so you just keep the hands of the steering wheel. You can relax a little bit more when driving. You um, maybe don't feel so much tension. And then you get don't get so much so tired that fast. That could be you know one one reason for that. And also when you're in traffic jams, that you don't have to concentrate that much. The car does it for you and solves the traffic jam. <clears throat> Overall, Volvo of course wants to had there someday that the car, uh, cars are driving fully autonomously and you remember maybe the goal from Volvo that's um, I think 2020 or 2025 something of that it was they want that no person gets killed in a new Volvo anymore and one of those reasons also should be that more autonomous systems are working that you have more support by the car to prevent accidents. I mean, overall, the pilot assist, it's an extra feature you have to pay for, of course, again, for traffic. It makes most sense. That's, I think, the, the main thing. With the new S90 or V90, also the speed in which it works has been increased to, I think it was 130 kilometers an hour. With the X90, it was just working at very low speeds. Here, also with higher speeds now. I'm not sure. I mean. It is some kind of those semi-autonomous features you do not have to have, but they are also the technology that, that planes the way for the full autonomous drive. And therefore we, or the manufacturers, need those systems to have a transition between the different drives. And let's be honest, we all like to drive cars, especially out to the fuel community here, but there are always certain situations where you say, ah, well, okay, that's not fun maybe I'll better read my emails now. And that could be also the, the thing then when you want to use those systems here. So at the moment, for example, I'm doing nothing, basically. What's it telling now? No, also traffic sign recognition says from 80 to 60, speed was reduced, and also distance to the car in front of me, speed was reduced. I did nothing, basically, now in the car reduced the speed to zero and also kept the car in lane as the pilot assist was activated as well. You always see that with the steering wheel when the steering wheel is marked green. So now I'll take over myself again. Oh, the acceleration is really good. What you can do other than uh, taking the dynamic mode is also putting the shifting lever to left then you are in this manual mode and there are no shifting pedals at the steering wheel here but you can just do it that you can really hear it you can use the central shifting stick to push it forward or backward then you can also shift on your own that might make sense also when you're going downhill and want to use the engine brake as much as possible or maybe you're in an overtaking process and want to give it some more power, that might make sense then for you. Overall, you usually leave this automatic in a normal mode and it just does its job. 
So what can you say as a conclusion for the S9 to a V90? First of all, the riding comfort is basically the same. So there's not, a, not much difference. This car I'm driving also could be the sedan and I wouldn't even realize it. It's just that no, it's the estate. The overview to the side is good, by the way. Very light also with the panoramic roof. And this is a big advantage if you consider the S90 here with a steep window at the rear. You can very well see who's behind you. So that's another reason to go for the estate. And good look through the frameless mirror there as well. So would I go for the S90 or for the V90? Hmm. Yeah, I like a sedan roofline, but all facts speak for the V90. Visibility, practicability, price, okay, it's a little bit more expensive, but it's not like the major difference. So I think I would rather go with the V90, and I will also like it more from the rear visual part. And what about the other competitors while driving? The E-Class is more silent. That's the class leader in there. Also with the fully Airmatic, so air suspension, all of the four wheels. It's also more comfortable. Mm, the Audi and the BMW are also focusing more on the agility part. But we've also tested the E-Class as the E43. That was a great compromise between comfort and sportiness. Yeah, so in this premium segment, in the upper mid-size segment, you have really a lot of different choices. I mean, you even have to consider the Skoda Superb now. I mean, it's half the price of the other vehicles, but it basically has a good premium feeling and even more space in the rear. So also consider that if for a good price performance ratio. What do you think about the sound here? I think it's not too bad. Yeah, it's no V6 sound, but for a two liter engine, I think also not too bad. Mm, I think it doesn't sound too turbo-ish. So some turbos make it like, like this. this from the turbo, you don't hear that that much here, so I'm pretty satisfied by that. Even on wet roads here, good performance from the, of the car. Still, I'm having a very comfortable ride. And the question is really, which one would I go for? The Volvo, the Audi A6, the Mercedes E-Class, or maybe also the BMW 5 Series. Well, the 5 Series has become quite old now. We will test the all new, 5 series of BMW in December, so join us for that as well, then we can tell you something about that. The Audi has more stability, especially on high speeds, uh, is for me the probably the sportiest car at the moment in the segment. The Mercedes is the most comfortable. This one here, the Volvo, I think gives you the coziest feeling, because we also have this design focus here. It has the most spectacular infotainment system and driving wise also goes more in this comfort region. And it's really often just a matter of personal preference and maybe which concise deal you get at, your, at the dealer for one of those brands. So really hard decisions if you're in this segment here. So any more questions maybe then put it in the comments or any remarks to our driving parts. Other than that, we have covered a lot of different aspects of this vehicle for today again. Hope you enjoyed it here with me. And let's hop on further to our final conclusion. And there it is, our final conclusion for today. I hope you enjoyed the special perspectives on the all-new Volvo V90. And I think we can say, yes, the Swedes are still able to build very good estates. It's not the very classic ones with the square dimensions in the rear. Yeah, you maybe don't fit that much stuff as in the very old models, but still very versatile to use here in the rear. And definitely, 
in all of the reasonable aspects better than the S90. Just if you're really a sedan lover, then it's still way to go with the S90. I think even though I prefer sedans in general from the visual perspective, I would still go for the V90 to have the you know the higher flexibility and as I said earlier either in a momentum trim level when it's available in your market for a best price performance or if it has to be the highest trim level you want to go for then probably the R design we have already shown you to have a better seating setup here the inscription um, tell me which one you liked best there I think of all the design exterior and the interior they did a great job there the designers and uh, also from the driving part, really a very competitive model. It's really a tough question which of the premium brands you should pick in this segment here. All have their different strengths, some of the weaknesses here and there, but also in a different setup. I think we have presented you all of the very good and maybe less good things here today about this car. Overall, it prevails that it's a really competitive car with a great design and also a very comfortable driving. Thank you very much for watching Auto Gefühl. Here was Thomas, and join us again next time.